Hi folks, my name is Darren Gertis. I'm just a professor trying to help provide context in the war in Ukraine so that you can more fully understand and appreciate what's going on so that you can be able to help in whatever way you deem best. On my community tab, I put this question. What do you want to know about Russian propaganda and disinformation? I spent a lot of time this week debunking some propaganda and disinformation. Uh, for example, the idea that uh, Mrs. Zelensky was uh, on a shopping spree at Cartier. It was all over social media. Well, it was all made up as well. And I went through systematically showing how that was the case. Okay, so I'm just going to answer the questions and we'll see what we can come up with. Wow, I always miss these. I would like to hear your thoughts about my take on Yaroslav Hunka's situation. If you recall, Yaroslav Hunka was the German, or not German, the uh, Ukrainian who worked under the Nazi SS whatever uh, or associated with it, who was in the Canadian Parliament, honored by the Canadian Parliament. It was kind of an unforced error because they could have done the same exact thing everything else that day without honoring him and this wouldn't have overshadowed it but apparently the speaker of the house didn't know that he was working with nazis and it became a great russian talking point okay um i see it as one of the most successful russian disinformation campaigns so far it's largely been effective in the media and even the canadian government itself if you look at his wikipedia page and the references he uses he was deployed to the eastern front to fight against the soviet army under the galatian division and he goes on and describes like what the galatian division did here and who they fought and the the decision uh the Galatian Division was not guilty of collective war crimes, confirming the decision at the Nuremberg Trials to decline to name the Galatian Division as well. They noted membership did not necessarily imply adherence to Nazi ideology. This all may be true. However, it's still a bad look, and they can use it uh, as propaganda points because they're not interested in truth. They're just going to spread whatever. And it just it just was a bad look. Like, you they could have not done that and it would have been better had they not. Um, so I am of the position that it, it was an unforced error that they could have just simply sidestepped and avoided. And, and what was, what was Hunka thinking to be a Yaroslav Hunka to be honored? Like, you know, maybe I'll decline that invitation and like, let, let that lie. Like, <laughs> um, so that's, that's my thought about it. Okay. Well, you've shown us that we need to check several sources, lots of repeaters out there too, to dissect in this information. If we don't have several sources to sift through this, what uh, what's a news con uh, consumer supposed to do? That's a really good question. Uh, so do you really, really, really trust the source? So you shouldn't really, really, really trust me because I'm just me. Like who who's this Darren Gertis guy? Um, now, it turns out that I, I think I'm a pretty legitimate source, but uh, you know, there are people, my point is anyone on YouTube can just turn, flip a switch and start recording. I mean, that's what I'm doing right now. There's no news bureau behind me. I have to do my research and I pay attention, but I could say something that's wrong. So even if I say something, check what I'm saying against other legitimate sources that you uh, can, can find. So some sources have journalistic standards. So like Reuters has journalistic standards. They'll talk about the Thomson Reuters journalistic principles at the end of every article. Um, there's a little link to that. Look for that kind of thing. I would also distrust Russian state media because Russian state media has been proven to lie regularly. And other sources don't just bald-faced lie. So like the New York Times, I'm a conservative and I find the New York Times to be pretty biased. but even in their bias, they're trying to communicate facts. So try to sift the facts from the narrative. Um, and it, it particularly grates me because like CNN and the New York Times, they're all mainstream media. But, you know, for years they were calling me a racist just because I'm a conservative. I'm not a racist. So, I, you know, I, I have to, I've already mentally discounted them. And this is where conservatives have gone in a large measure because having discounted the mainstream media, they're looking for alternatives. And again, any guy can turn on a YouTube video and start talking. And But now what's the veracity of that guy with the YouTube video? Okay, so um, 
you just have to really sift through the veracity of the source. I guess that's the, the best answer. There were two replies here. I, I want to know uh, what the replies were. Well, books and training videos exist to uncover disinformation. Simply treat it like courtroom does. Uh, that's good. Ignore drama, including fear, loathing, and urgency. Ignore ad hominem insults. Sources for facts should briefly uh, should briefly look relevant as time allows. Yeah, by the way, when you do see ad hominem and you do see drama and fear and loathing, that's usually a sign to discount the source a little bit like maybe that's not the best uh enigma uh says plus don't believe complete strangers on social <laughs> yeah yeah don't believe complete strangers on social media even if they have a hundred people agreeing with them and use common sense when it sounds unbelievable yeah uh, that, that's right you shouldn't even necessarily believe your friends because your friends can repost something where they believe strangers and then you're going oh well Bob said it. He wouldn't. He wouldn't mislead me. But Bob is post reposting something that he might have saw from a stranger that isn't necessarily true. Okay. I'd like to know if they really believe the lies that they spread. I don't think so. Uh, I think some do, but like so. I think when you're talking like at the RT level, I don't think that they do. Uh, the Tass Pravda, that kind of thing. I think that Scott Ritter is a true believer. Uh, I'm not sure about, say, Jackson Hinkle, who I think is uh, might be motivated differently. Uh, so, yeah, some do, some don't, but it doesn't really matter. Even even though I believe that Scott Ritter believes what he's talking about, I don't believe that it's factually correct. So it doesn't matter even if he believes it or not. Uh, let's see. Uh, this uh, General Ion Mickey, uh, Mickey Pesepta wrote a reference book about the Russian disinformation. He also inserted the word, word disinformation into the language. And you can you can find uh, Pesepta's YouTube video, and it's worth watching, where he talks about how that works. Uh, why do the Russians always blame Ukraine after they themselves hit Ukrainian civilian targets? By blaming Ukraine, aren't they admitting that it's bad and it's the wrong thing to do? Because the evidence of them doing such acts deliberately isn't disputable. I have trouble understanding why they blame Ukraine for acts their own leadership considers a success. Please help me understand. Okay, so there was an article about a week ago where uh, they were talking about removing all the VPNs from a VPN access from the internet in Russia. Remember the mindset is not that we have freedom and we can check all sources, but in Russia it is, well, we can lock down information and not have you hear it. Jake Bro talked about this a day or two ago where he's talking about the VPN issue as well. <clears throat> And so uh, the younger you are, the more likely you are to have a VPN on your computer. And this was one of the highest selling apps in the first few days of the war. Uh, the older you are, the more you are likely to get your news from Russian state media in, within Russia. And the more likely you are to be a uh, ardent supporter of Vladimir Putin. Like there's, it's statistically demonstrably demonstrated. So they, they're, Attitude toward this is, well, if we can just get rid of the VPNs, they can't get news anywhere else, and then they'll buy our line. So they're, they don't have any trouble lying about this because they're, they're interested in convincing their own audience what they lie about rather than that there was, um, you know, that I'm just going to lie and not care. It's not, it's not that. So, for example, a hotel was hit in a particular city. Uh, and the Russian sources said that there were 40 international soldiers there. The local sources on the ground were saying exactly the opposite. There's like two people here and there weren't any soldiers anywhere and they just hit a hotel. Like, why did they hit a hotel? So it's that kind of thing. And, and we just have to understand that they are not interested in, in truth and telling the truth. They're interested in pushing a narrative. And that's what's going on. Why governments are not clamping down on it? Why are they not properly monitoring it and making social media companies tackle it or reduce it? So this making social media companies tackle or reduce it is a very, very difficult thing. And if you like whose whose truth are you trying to to uh, tackle or reduce? And it, that can get very thorny. Right. So what Twitter did was incredibly obnoxious to conservatives because Twitter's clamping down on what they considered untruth. 
really clamped down on all conservative opinion. Now, it, it got rid of some of the untruth, but it also got rid of a lot of truth from, you know, as conservatives understood it, that wasn't like the obnoxious, toxic stuff. And so that is a danger to free speech. I'm on the other side of the equation. I say, bring out more free speech, but then individually address it, which is exactly what I was doing. So in my very last video, I was talking about this. I just said it uh, before with uh, the 90,000 men. Here's why uh, the claim doesn't add up. And the truth about o o Olena Zelensky's shopping spree at, at uh, um, Cartier, right? You have to be able to address it. That's the harder path, but that's the freer path. And so... Um, yeah, if you monitor and make social media companies tackle or reduce it, what you're going to do is inhibit lots of otherwise positive free speech. And I'm not sure we want to do that. But it's a hard thing to have to address. The impact far exceeds any truthfulness. That, that's right. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, why voting Republican? I saw, I read this guy's uh, thing a little while ago. And last week he talked about why voting Republican is a vote against Ukraine. And you should be, you're bad if you vote Republican because you're just voting against Ukraine. And I, I don't believe that that's the case. Um, I, I think that that is uh, an incorrect way of looking at it. And he goes on for a few paragraphs about it. But when we get to the end, he actually had something useful to say. So I'm not going to read all of what he had to say, but I'm, I'm going to read this. A few last things. I found it interesting that you described yourself as a neoconservative the other day. I, I think pe people would paint me as that. I would just say conservative. So I, I agreed to that you know, like if you're going to try to put me into a box, do you consider having been part of or a part of the Tea Party movement? Who would you like to be, see become speaker? Okay, so let's look at this. Let's see speaker candidates. Okay, speaker of the House candidates uh, of the House candidates. Okay, so here's a choice of those that are here a day ago who's running for speaker of the House. Steve Scalise. Okay, Steve Scalise would actually be a prick for Ukraine. Like he's a, these are all Republicans there here now. Okay, because the Republicans control the House, so he's not bad as far as Ukraine goes. He actually voted for pro-Ukraine bills a few times. I don't think he was as ardent or will be as ardent as um, uh, the uh, McCarthy was. McCarthy actually got on the right page with with that. Jim Jordan voted against it, I believe. Uh, Hearn voted against it, I believe. Elsie Stefanak is a New York Republican, which is a good thing because she's in New York and that orbit with, uh, and the reason is because m there's much more liberal support than uh, Republican support. Uh, <clears throat> but she said something on right initially after the Ukraine invasion, but I haven't heard boo from her since. She is also a very big Trump supporter, so I, I don't know that that would be a good thing. She's pretty young, but she's reasonably powerful within the Republican Party. Um, I don't know that she would be a good fit. I don't think Byron Donalds, the Florida Republican, would be a good fit. Uh, these are the ones who have announced so far. Uh, and former President Donald Trump would not be a good fit. Now, there's this thing floating around about, you know, draft Trump to be the Speaker of the House. Well, how? He's not even in Congress. Okay. I don't know that he has to be in Congress. Now, I did my doctoral dissertation on the United States Congress as they were forming the Constitution. OK, so it was the leadership assumptions of American statesmen during the Constitutional Convention and Ratification Debates 1787 to 1789. That's the title. It's a mouthful. But that's how dissertations are. I, as I recall, they assumed that the member, the speaker would be a member of the House. But I don't recall any instance where they, they absolutely said that you had to be because they weren't thinking that anyone was going to be from anywhere other than a member of the House. Like they, 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 it didn't occur to them, I don't think, that anybody would think that the speaker should be anyone except for a congressman. It's kind of like... Um, I, I worked on a, a congressional campaign in 1998 out in Tennessee. Um, and at the time, there was a guy named um, Byron Looper. Byron, he changed his, main to, his middle name to Low Tax, so it could be on the ballot as Byron Low Tax Looper. 
He was a Democrat who came up from Georgia to Tennessee and ran as a Republican because that's the only way that he could run against a Democrat who is in charge. And, and he ran in both the congressional race and the state race simultaneously. So state Senate as well as the congressional race. Now, he lost to my candidate in the congressional race, but he he could still run in the state Senate race because the good people of Tennessee never thought that somebody was going to run in both things simultaneously. And then like they didn't guard against that for that reason. So I, I tell you that to tell you this, um, former president Donald Trump could potentially be there, except he couldn't because they also put rules in that anyone that's under any kind of indictment in the past two years or something like that can't be it. So I, as I understand, I read this for, I, I saw this on, on one news channel. I could be, that could be incorrect because it wasn't, uh, a, you know, a news channel like an ABC or NBC or CBS or Fox or CNN or something like that. It was a YouTuber that was fairly well spoken about stuff. So he could have his facts wrong, but I don't think it is. I think he's probably correct. So I don't think that this is any real threat. There's also another uh, wild card candidate here, and that is it could be the Democrat um, minority leader, which is uh, Hakeem Jeffries, who, if he was to be like, if enough Republicans broke, he could be actually, now, I don't think that's going to happen. Generally, you don't give your speakership away when you're the majority party. That's kind of foolish. You lose all control of the agenda, but stranger things have happened. I mean, we didn't think that this was going to happen to begin with as it did with, uh, the, the speaker, you know, uh, actually being removed or vacated. Okay. Um, all right. So I don't know if I answered that question well enough. And if you do, could you see Republicans cutting a deal with the Dems to get someone across the finish line? That's very possible. Um, and that's going to make it very hard for that person to govern. The block of eight seemed to have genuine disdain and animosity for McCarthy that kept them united. I'm not, and that's, that's also true that, um, especially Gates hated McCarthy. I'm not sure that the same unity is there in blocking a reasonable choice for speaker. God help Ukraine if Jim Jordan is speaker. And again, I, you know, I look at this list and none of them seem to my mind to be as good as McCarthy was for Ukraine. Um, like on other issues, I like some of these guys for different reasons, just because I'm a conservative, but on Ukraine, they're pretty much all bad and I don't want that. Right. So, OK. Um, all right. So are you familiar with cult deprogramming? Does propaganda overlap? If so, how long and how effective is the programming? I don't know enough about the programming to be a, uh, a way of uh, like any any reasonable expert of anything. I ironically was watching videos about this just last week because I'm I'm really interested in authoritarian and cults and uh, dictators and things along those lines, just because studying leadership, I'm looking at like, wow, that's interesting how bad leadership works. And it works remarkably similarly, whether it's a um, FLDS cult or a uh, or, or what North Korea is doing in sending their um, their dollar dollar heroes. If you look up dollar heroes on YouTube and you, you'll see the video about that, uh, or, uh, other cults and the way that they operate. I'm not sure if the programming is effective or how effective it is. Uh, but it's uh, trying to undo a certain mindset is a very difficult thing. And there probably is a good deal of overlap. I, I just don't know exactly what it is, but that's a, that's a fan, fascinating question, Bruce. Okay. Yes. Do you have a video of several classifications of propaganda? One that includes a smelly herring. Um, I don't have a video about several classifications about propaganda. There are a, a number of videos out there, a number of good videos about how propaganda works. Um, how to spot Russian propaganda in its natural habitat. Okay. So I've spent a great deal of time since the war began. I would look at this is the easiest way to do it. Um, I would read articles from 
uh, reputable sources, Wall Street Journal or New York Times or CNN or, and now listen, I, I'm, when I say reputable sources, I'm qualifying. I know that there's narrative there. Okay. So fact-based Reuters, AP, um, uh, Guardian, uh, Radio Free Europe. I'm reading all these articles. And then after doing that, I read the articles in RT, Russia Today, that, it, that are related to or is trying to tell the same story as those articles in Reuters and AP and so, so forth and so on. And you'll see a very clear difference in the way that the narrative is being spun. That's the easiest way to see propaganda in its natural habitat. Okay, why some of our politicians are playing Putin's fiddle. What is it? Power, money, trade, what? It could be all of those things. I mean, mice is a classic formulation. Um, and look up, just look up mice and propaganda and you'll see what it is. It's money influence, um, yeah, something, and uh, ego. Uh, C, I can't, I'm trying to remember what C was. But that's a classic formulation of it if you want to understand. Um, and different ones are motivated by different things. So I can't exactly explain, but I think there are some that aren't motivated by any of those things. And they just brought, bought the narrative because like others around them are buying that narrative. And that's a really bizarre thing to, to happen. And that's when it takes on a life of its own. Um, I think that some, some conservatives hear some conservative sounding talk, even though there's not real conservative action like a conservative in russia is something very different than the conservative in the united states but some things are overlapping properly like let's say they're they're not big fans of woke this or that right so there is a little overlap there but it's it's motivated it's it's coming from a very different uh source it's coming from a, it, they're drinking from very different streams and but it's confused uh yeah i, I can't really I can't really tell why there's no broad way of saying why all politicians are playing Putin's fiddle. They, they come for very different reasons. Why does some GOP repeat Russian lies verbatim? Where's the money trail? I don't think it's all about money. I think some of it is that they think they're hearing something similar, like an ideological ally, but it's really not. It's something different, but they, they don't have necessarily the discernment to see that, to, to figure that out. That and others around them are all saying the same thing. This is this is a really dis, disjointed uh, and disconcerting thing to me. I'm, I find myself agreeing with CNN, and not because I'm a moderate. I'm not a moderate. I'm a I'm a full fledged conservative. But on Ukraine, I would be with the Reagan conservatives, not with the Trumpians. Um, and on, on most things, I'm with the Reagan conservatives. I I, I mean, I bought a T-shirt. Uh, that was a, a throwback Reagan Bush 84 shirt uh, when Trump was in office to, to show like this is the kind of conservative that I am, not not that. And I don't think Trump is really actually conservative. He's a Republican, but he's a populist. And there's a big difference between the two. They look similar, but they're really not exactly the same thing. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it has to be about a money trail. There's just, there's some things that look ideologically the same. And then they see other people that are like them saying the same kind of thing. And then they repeat lies that they don't realize are lies. And well, there we go. Why are more Republican House members subscribing to it than Democrats just based on how they vote? Well, that's a really good question. Okay, so it's not, let's let's broaden it from not just the House members, but Republicans as opposed to Democrats in the general population. I think Republicans are more, okay, the mainstream media is, uh, they tell, they give facts, but they paint, shape a narrative when they give the facts. And I think that has turned off a lot of conservatives who mainstream media, like 93%, uh, gave money to Clinton uh, 20 years ago, like Bill, Bill Clinton. And that hasn't changed since. Like, I remember seeing that stat and I was like, whoa, 93% to 7% favored the Democrats as opposed to the Republicans. So what kind of, so you can see that there's bias that's going to emanate from that. So 
over time, Republicans have moved away from mainstream media to alternative media. Mostly, initially, it was AM radio, and then when the internet came, they would have they would have embraced the internet a lot more. So they're more likely to embrace the alternative than the mainstream with the facts, even with the narrative. And so I think that's one of the major things at play. And then so it's easy for them to fall prey to uh, Russia's propaganda or disinformation because of that. Uh, you have to be really judicious about your sources. Okay, why are pro-Ukraine YouTubers fighting each other? It weakens the cause. Yes, it breaks my heart. I'm not going to get into that because I don't know all the facts. I have communicated with both sides of this, um, and I, I hope that they can resolve what they're doing. I but I don't know all that caused it. As I understand, Enforcer did this. Mercado said, you know, took umbrage with something and was fighting with him. And then they're fighting back and forth. And I, I, I just, I don't know what even was the triggering event that caused it. But it just, it, you're right. It, it weakens the cause. I, I want all Ukraine, pro-Ukrainian voices to be out there and to be heard. Uh, why Russia is so rubbish at misinformation, it never makes any sense and always looks hilarious like we're all idiots. So that's a great question. Like w I was talking about this with this, with the Olena Zelensky shopping spree at Cartier. Like <laughs> if you haven't watched this video, you got to watch this video. Like they created this disinformation and they try to create a fake receipt that she bought stuff at Cartier. Um, but the receipt was dated not for the day that she was in New York City, but it was dated for the day that she was in Canada. She couldn't have done it. <laughs> so, okay. At any rate, they are. I mean, it's like you got one job. It's to create false information. Like, be good at that. But they're they're really not pretty good at it. Okay. So that's it. That's that's. I went through all the all the questions, and uh, I appreciate your taking the time to answer the questions, and hopefully this was helpful for somebody. Thanks for your time and your attention and the likes and the shares and the subscribes, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.